Uh, our next guest is the curator of political and military history at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History and the author of The Freedoms We Lost, Consent and Resistance in the Revolutionary Era. She's an expert on 18th century American history with a focus on social, political, and home life. Welcome, Dr. Barbara Clark Smith. Thanks very much, Rob. Great to be here. Your book, uh, The Freedoms We Lost, is uh, it talks about exactly that, the freedom, freedoms that we lost. Now, generally, when we talk about the American Revolutionary War, it tends to be in terms of the freedoms that we gained. Uh, but what were some of the freedoms that we, we lost? You're right that we start with the freedoms we gained, and I'm, I at no point deny that we gained them. We certainly gained some freedoms from the revolution. But in retrospect, we tend to focus on that and not necessarily on uh, ideas of freedom that were important at the time, but aren't so important now. That includes policing. Uh, policing was an institution that was very different from what it is today. In the colonial period, the colonists in British North America chose not to have a professional police. Right. I mean, that they you probably remember they were opposed to standing armies in peacetime. That's partly because um, they were afraid those armies would in, enforce unpopular laws. Right. And they preferred having sheriffs or constables, different officials with different names who might be elected or might be appointed in different colonies, but who relied on ordinary people in the community in order to enforce the law. Um, the second one would be in the courtroom where people, these sort of men could sit on a jury. And the jury had a somewhat different role then um, because the, the king is the one prosecuting, right? So if I was accused of a crime, it would be Rex, meaning King, Rex V. Smith, um, not the people V. Smith, no, in that courtroom, it's the petty jury that represent the people. And juries had various prerogatives to um, have a say, not only in what actually happened, the facts of a case, but also in whether it was illegal, what, what the law, act, whether the law actually applied to the facts that they found. And then finally, besides the policing and the courtroom, there's another arena where ordinary people can also make their voice heard. And that's in when there were public punishments because people weren't all shunted off into prisons where you don't see what's happening. They, there were often physical punishments, um, of course, standing in the stocks, um, being beaten uh, in the stocks and ultimately uh, hangings and executions. And at all of those occasions, um, there were, there were uh, spectators who kind of participated. For example, you could be very sympathetic to someone in the stocks because you really didn't think what they did wasn't so bad. Or you could throw eggs at them or something too if you really thought what they did was horrible. Um, and even when it came to executions, it was possible if there was very strong local public opinion for a rescue to take place, somebody to be rescued from hanging um, because there, is, there weren't enough police, there weren't armed men uh, enforcing this. So it required some participation by people. I, I do wanna say that um, it's important to remember that all these places for popular participation in enforcing the law existed because the, the head of it executing the law was not elected, it was the king, right? So you haven't had a choice yet. You've had a choice about passing the law uh, by having a voice in, a, in your legislature or in the lower house of your legislature, in England, in the House of Commons, in the parliament, um, if you were in England. So as Englishmen, American colonists felt, okay, we have that voice, that's, in, that's critical to freedom. But they also thought voices in execution of the law were critical. And it's precisely because that was, that was the, the execution of the law was taking place 
under uh, auspices of the king, whom nobody had much choice about. Some people have written and said, well, Barbara Clark Smith calls these freedoms, and they're not exactly freedoms because they're forms of participating. Mm -hmm. um, and my answer to that is, I think that's really kind of what freedom is. I, I don't think freedom means no one ever bothers you ever and you're never subject to anybody else's or any authority. That's just not the way the world is. I yeah. think it means you have a say in who the authority is and in how that authority is used and what our rules are that we agree to live by and that that say is real. Well, and you also talk about sort of there's the, the the right to be legislated for laws to be created and then the right for those, whether or not those laws are followed are kind of viewed as pretty different. You know, now if a law is passed, it's with the attitude is, well, now that's the law. But right. back then it, it seems that people would often just choose to not follow laws. And that was kind right. of, if the community felt that that's the way it should be, that's the way it would be. Yeah, to a degree, that's that's true, and it's and we we assume all the important decisions have been made by the time it becomes a law. I guess and I guess that is still kind of true today. I mean, we we don't use blinkers anymore. I, I, we're driving, but it's a funny. It is true that um, people got accustomed to realizing that some laws may not really apply the same in every place, and so there was a lot more space for it being different. And that's partly because places were further apart and, and you weren't traveling. I mean, one, we, we want a fairly standard uh, set of laws because we want to be able to travel to another state and not be surprised that something is illegal there. Or, you know, there's, we, we have dealings on a much broader scale. So some of it's just practical. But I, I do think, um, the system of common law, which says it matters what the precedent is. It matters what the other earlier courts have said in this neighborhood, right? And it might be different here than there, you know? And, and so the, of course there's always some slippage between what the law says and how people actually live right. and what an excellent, perfect enforcement would be and what's actually possible. Yeah, um, like there are jaywalking laws in Boston. There are laws. As a society have decided that those are not enforceable. <laughs> those are not enforceable. But you, uh, another, another thing that you talk about in the book a lot is you talk about the uh, sort of the, the people and the, the mob. What, what are the differences between the people and, and the mob? Well, that's always to be argued about, right? Um, the people are when the ones I admire and agree with are doing something, and the mob is when the ones <laughs> I disagree with are doing something. And whether that would be, in my view, whether what gets determined uh, depends on how the law works out. So you can think of something like the Boston Massacre crowd, and I, we, I think we often use the word crowd because it's kind of more neutral. Yeah. Um, the British would have called that a mob. Um, and whether they could convince people, yeah, that's a mob, um, and therefore are they not representing the people, depended on, on many things, including what sort of people were there, right? In the case of the massacre, uh, crowd. Um, it was tricky because there were fewer well-to-do respectable merchants or elite people around or even solid middle class. There were some people who could kind of be considered ruffians and, you know, sailors are kind of, they don't, they sort of live here. They don't really live here. They're not the most peaceful law-abiding group. Uh, Crispus Attucks, African-American, uh, you know, so um, the decision of the patriots to say, no, th th that group includes apprentices, it includes artisans, work laboring men, sailors, that, that counts as the people was a very strong uh, statement. And whether they could make that stick or not would depend on what happened at trial. So part, part of what's um, 
what what you had to figure out if you were going to go contest the law or going to go um, try to rescue someone from punishment or any of those things was could you get away with it or would you be hunted down and that that depended on how many connected and respectable people you had connections with and also how you behaved right I mean you could behave in ways that were so destructive um, even of property uh, that it was unquestionably going to offend the property people and you had to have at least some of those people on your side. I think the most important thing to know is that those things were unsettled, even at the time the crowd is acting. Um, it isn't clear if they'll end up being defined as a riot and some people will end up um, punished for taking part or whether it will be the voice of the people. You're uh, particularly interested in social and home life uh, in mm -hmm. this time period. How did the revolution uh, change women's lives? Well, that's one of my favorite topics um, because I think until fairly recently, we saw women as not participating in the revolution or a few of them participated um, like Molly Pitcher at the Battle of Monmouth, New Jersey. Since I grew up in New Jersey, I learned about Molly Pitcher in school as a kid. Um, and we now are looking at it differently. We've learned a lot. We realize that if you're going to look at the arenas where men were assigned to participate, like the army, you're going to see few women. But there were lots of areas that women were uh, participating in. And I think the main one prior to the outbreak of the war itself was in the non-importation, non-consumption agreements, those trade boycotts against uh, British goods. So when Britain passed taxes on these various imports, uh, consumer goods, so paper or lead and tea and any number of things, um, neighborhoods got together and began uh, agreeing to boycott those goods. And it starts with merchants saying, we're not gonna, merchants in Boston saying, we're not gonna buy these things and sell them to be, because um, there are taxes on them. We don't, and that would, that would set the precedent that it's okay to tax us. And we don't believe that. So let's, let's uh, start a movement that's buying homemade pr products. And for women, uh, for elite ladies, it means not sitting and drinking tea and tea parties, but for most women, farm women, ordinary women in, uh, in artisan shops or who are married to artisans running the household, it means not purchasing English cloth, English tea, and producing as much as you can, a uh, homespun cloth. And um, so what this did that was interesting was it created this space in which women could show their allegiance to this patriot cause. Yeah. But uh, thank you so much for your time. This has been so interesting. The book is called The Freedoms We Lost by Dr. Barbara Clark Smith. We'll be right back.